Hello, today is October 28, 2008. We're meeting today with Mr. John Petrovic at his home in Windsor, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, John, and uh, thanks for participating today. Thanks for coming in. Let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Well, I was born July the 17th, 1924, in South Omaha, Nebraska. I was the oldest of uh, three children. My parents were John and Antoinette Petrovic, and I had my schooling, all my schooling in Omaha. I graduated from St. Joseph's High School in June of 42, and after that I went to work for Cutting Hay Packing Company in South Omaha, working in the canning room. And uh, the war was in full, full tilt at that time, and uh, uh, along about December of 1942, December 7th in fact, my buddy and I decided we wanted to go join the Marines. And uh, I don't know whether it was because we seen a Wake Island movie or John, you know, one of the John Wayne movies and we felt we were going to be real heroic and go in the service. But anyway, we went down to enlist in the Marine Corps and we found out on the 1st of December of that year that they froze all enlistments. It seems that some of these services were getting a, more play than the others and so they were trying to equalize it. Uh, thereby they were, uh, therefore they were uh, inducting, running people through the induction centers and if they, quali they told them after they had their physical what they qualified for and you could select what, whatever service you wanted then. Well, since we, they wouldn't take us in December, we just went back to work and I waited until I was drafted on April the 19th of 43 and uh, I qualified for all three services. Uh, there was no Air Force then, it was mm -hmm. just, uh, it was Army Air, Air Corps. But anyway, I uh, selected the Navy. I guess I selected the Navy because over the time, over time, I decided that warm bunk and good food was better than laying in the mud. So I selected the Navy, and I was sworn in uh, in Omaha there on uh, April the 20th. And a week later, the 27th of April, we left on the old Burlington Railroad and uh, went up to Farragut, Idaho. Now, when you say we, did you and your buddy go together? Or? No, no. Uh, yeah. I was in a group yeah. of, uh, of about 35 or 40 people that went. It was a draft, but. My buddy, he was just, a, he was about six months younger than I was, so he didn't come up for draft at the same time I did. Do you remember leaving home that day, what it was like? Because uh, oh, yeah. if I hadn't been away from home, I would imagine, up to yeah, that point. That was, uh, first off, I had some feelings that, uh, you know, you wonder whether you're going to come back. Sure. And it uh, had never been away. You wonder what you're going to confront. And I remember my mother didn't go to the depot with us. And... Uh, I later learned she stayed home and cried. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, so you took the train up to Idaho? We took the train to Idaho, to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, I was going to boot camp at Farragut, Idaho, which is located about 30 miles, I think it's about 30 miles north of Coeur d'Alene, right along a little town called Athol there. And it was located on Lake Ponderé. It's a huge lake up there in northern Idaho. And uh, at that time, there were six camps comprising the whole uh, base. And then there was also a naval hospital there. As a matter of fact, the naval hospital was the largest hospital in the Pacific Northwest at that time. Hmm. Anyway, I went through boot camp, which was the usual shots and uh, strength tests and obstacle courses and marching. And, uh, the only real dud in boot camp was that the camp was quarantined for scarlet fever at one period. And we were the one company in the camp that didn't have scarlet fever, so we ended up on mess duty for about two and a half oh, weeks. How, how was your transition from civilian life to military life? Was it much of a well, you know, change or a shock for you? Oh, it was, it, the whole thing was a shock. But the thing is, they uh, they kept kept you so busy that when you did have some spare time, you were either trying to write a letter or you were trying to get your laundry done, you know, something like that, you know, and. Uh, if you did throw your cigarette butt and miss the receptacle, there was always some, we called them the square knot admirals, that were some of the guys who were designated to uh, help the chief lead the company, the, some of the older people or somebody that might have had ROTC experience, but they wore a little petty officer badge with a square knot on them, so we called them square knot admirals. 
<laughs> but if you miss the receptacle, then you'd end up holy stoning the head deck or something like that. You know? But uh, yeah, boot camp wasn't all that bad. Then after after about nine weeks, I guess, it was in late June. We got we graduated and I got a boot leave of 15 days. I went back to the outgoing unit and. Uh, I was selected for a draft going to radio school at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And that was uh, real good duty up there because we were living right in the dormitories, right on the lakeshore up there for the first 16 weeks. And the last four weeks we lived in Camp Randall Stadium where they played football up there. They had a facility on the East Stands that, huh. that we lived in. And uh, we learned radio theory, procedure, all that stuff that goes along with the, being a radio operator. Any idea why you were chosen as a radio operator, or is that something you this asked is, for? Uh, you took uh, exams up there at boot camp, and they they evaluated you, and they okay. decided I'd make a good radio operator, okay. I guess. So. And then uh, after boot camp, after uh, radio school, I graduated from that on December the 6th. I got a 10-day uh, delay en route to submarines. While I was in radio school, they showed a uh, movie about submarines. I had never really thought about submarines until that time. And when they showed this, uh, something about it really impressed me. I really, really? liked yeah. it. And uh, oh, a few days later, they says, anybody that's willing to go, uh, volunteer for submarines can go over and report for a physical on such and such a day. So, so I went over and took the physical. And by golly, the, the day we were leaving there, on December the 6th, they read off the draft, and I was one of seven men selected for submarines. Now, that's a pretty selective process, too, isn't it, oh, to yes. be chosen for that? Yeah, yeah, that's a strict physical to yeah. start with. And uh, I was in shape in those days. And uh, <laughs> then uh, I arrived at uh, sub school on December the 18th. That's my dad's birthday. I remember I had to re be there at, on the 18th. I had gone home for about uh, six or seven days and went on up to sub school. And uh, for the rest of that year, 1943, we were pretty busy up there in the receiving barracks, what they call the receiving barracks, take, doing the, uh, taking all the exams. We had to go to, for another physical, we had to go through the uh, psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. That was a strenuous test, that right, psychiatrist sure. test. Yeah. And then we had to take a 50, uh, 50 pounds of pressure in a pressure chamber. We had to go down to the lower base. And they put us in a pressure chamber and they uh, put, give us 50 pounds. I remember there was one fella, he was having a tough time. He was blowing, holding his nose and blowing to equalize the pressure in his ears. He was blowing so hard that his nose was bleeding, but he passed it. He did pass I'll it. I'll be had, darn. As a matter of fact, he was a Chinese fellow named Fong. He just died here about two years ago, I seen. But... Uh, he served on a submarine pogey. But then after that, we went to the diving tower. Now, they had a 100-foot diving tower. If you ever seen this water tower up here on uh, 257 and 34, uh -huh. that yeah. big tower yeah. with the yeah. big t top on it, that's what that, that reminds me of that diving tower we had at New London. And they had elevator shaft down the side. You go, uh, What they do is we'd uh, put on the Monson lung. It's a bladder-type lung that we put on our chest, strapped to our back, and they locked it around our neck. And it had a tube coming up that was fit in the mouth, and it, it had a uh, fitting that would fit between your uh, lips and your teeth, and then a piece that you bit down on. And uh, then they'd charge this with oxygen, and uh, that's what we had to breathe through when we were in the water. And they took us down 18 feet, equalized the pressure, in that tower, the 18 feet of water, and then we'd come up a line, and every three feet we'd stop and take two or three breaths to equalize the pressure. Then we went down to 50 feet and then down to 100 feet. Now, the reason for that pressure chamber was we had to take 50 pounds because at 100 feet, 106 feet of water, I think it is, there's 50, foot of pressure, uh, 50 pounds of pressure per square inch. So we had to take that 50 pounds of pressure and then come up that the uh, line uh, equalizing the pressure as we come. What was that like? Do you remember? Uh... It was scary. It was scary. Yeah. I, uh, after the 18 foot, uh, it wasn't so bad because we we knew what we were going to, what to expect. But you know, you're coming up. You're the only one there. 
you got your head back, you got your hands on the line, you got your feet wrapped around, and you come to that knot, and you just keep hoping that you don't break loose of that line and pop up to the surface. Oh, you boy. know, it's it's kind of uh, scary, and uh, but th that was in case that we got sunk in the shallow water, you could still escape. And uh, then. After all the tests were over on July, uh, the first part of January, January 3rd, we started submarine school. It was a four-week school. They had simulators there. Uh, it was built, one simulator I remember was built like the control room, part of the control room where you had bow planes and stern planes. Now on a submarine, on the front part of the submarine, you have two flaps that when you dive, you can rig them out. They come out like short wings. Those work forward and aft, and that controls your depth. They also have a stern plane on the back of the, on the stern of the boat that's, that are, that are out all the time. They're stationary, but they do work forward and aft, and that controls the angle of the boat as you go down. So when you uh, dive the boat, you put the uh, bow planes and stern planes on full tilt, and as the boat starts going down, you start bringing the bow planes back to when you get to your depth level. The stern plane, if you want to, they tell you what, uh, when you're diving, they tell you what angle they want to control, so you, you adjust that stern plane accordingly to control the angle as you go down. So they had a simulator to teach us that. We had to draw all the different systems, the hydraulic system, the air, the different air systems, the, the trim system. You see on a submarine they have a trim system where you have a trim tank in the center of the boat, you have trim uh, tanks forward and aft, and uh, if you're heavy, you can pump water from the trim tanks out to sea. If you're light, you can pump water in from sea. If you're heavy aft, you can pump it forward. If you're heavy in the middle, you can pump it to both ends. It's, now, were you being cross-trained on these various things, or were you still, were you, did you go in as a radio man? I'm a radio man, but we had to know everything on it. Okay. On a submarine, you had to qualify within two runs. You had to be able to run every system on the boat. Wow, wow. You had to be able to, you had to draw the, the hydraulic system and explain the whole hydraulic system. You had to be able to start the engines. You had to, be able to learn to fire a torpedo. Wow. And uh, learn all that. They, every man had to know everything on, a, on the submarine. I'll be darned. That's, uh, you know, uh, your, your life depended on it. If somebody went haywire, you had to step in. Anyway, we had four weeks of that training to learn the boat and all the different systems. And then uh, I, after that, we had four weeks of radio, advanced submarine radio, which was merely working with the type transmitters they had on the submarines and uh, the type receivers. And we had to do some copying, of course, uh, while we were there. But of course, we had got the basic copying in the, in the first radio school. And then after that, we had four more weeks of uh, sound on a submarine, the radio man is a sound man. And when the water, when you went down below 60 feet, the old ears of the radio man were the eyes of the boat. So we, they taught us uh, how to operate sound gear. If I may, I, uh, later years, I went in the, back for the commissioning of the USS Nebraska, the nuke. And uh, on their sound gear nowadays, they, as soon as they get a contact, they put it to the computer, and the computer will show you uh, what boat it is and what ship it is and everything else. We didn't have that. Wow. When, when we heard a ship, we'd count the screws, you know, the, mm -hmm. the pulsation of the screw, and we could tell if it was a fast screw, we knew it was a lighter ship. If it was a heavy screw, thump, 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 you knew it was a heavy, it was a big ship. And that's the primitive way we had to work. Wow. <laughs> but anyway, uh, after that, then we had two weeks of night lookout school, and in April of 44, I left New London, went through Omaha, Denver, on the Mare Island, spent about two weeks in Mare Island waiting for a ship, and then on May 8th of 44, we caught a Danish ship called the Day Star. We were in a group, there were about 200 of us going. Which was go going to be your crew? No, it was just the replacements going out there oh. to... to Fill in for it. See, I never got new construction. There was two ways when you graduated from submarine school. You could either get uh, put in and maybe get new construction. That was a new boat being built at New London or one of the other bases. Or you'd be sent out 
to Pearl Harbor or, or Southwest Pack, which was Australia, to be a replacement for the submarine crews that were being transferred off the boats after several runs. Well, I drew uh, the Southwest Pacific, which was Australia, but it took us forever to get there. We, like I say, we left uh, sub base in April, set two weeks or three weeks in Mare Island. We left uh, May 8th and we went to Milne Bay, New Guinea. And uh, that's as far as the ship was going. So we were dumped there in Milne Bay. And I think the first night in Milne Bay was my most depressed night. I felt the most depressive of any time in my life. Is that, that right? We had, uh, got off the ship the first part of June. It was rainy season in New Guinea. Can I interrupt you sure. uh, uh, before you get the story? I always like to ask people uh, on these crossings, particularly here's a here's an Omaha boy, landlocked state yeah. of Nebraska. What was it like crossing? Did you get your sea legs? How was... Uh... Uh, the first couple of days I was a little queasy. Well, the first day I was a little queasy. Uh, but after that, I had no problem. Uh, I'll tell you a story about my wife later. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, we uh, went across the equator. We had a little initiation ceremony across the equator. Yeah, we yeah. Had a, I remember my knees were raw that night because we had to crawl around the hot necks, <laughs> decks in our shorts, and I had my tic-tac-toe in my hair, you know. And later I got sunburned there, and my scalp was pretty... But uh, they couldn't stop the ship and have a big ceremony. It was just kind of a battle machines you went through and stuff like that. And uh, as we were going across, we'd have we'd have a regular breakfast and dinner, but for lunch we'd get an apple and a pack of Rollies, Rollie <laughs> cigarettes. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then they wonder why all the veterans got problems yeah. with the lungs today. Anyway, we got to Milne Bay, New Guinea, and it's it's right at the very tip of the tail of the, the pheasant that's flying. If you look at the map of Aust uh, New Guinea, it mm -hmm. looks like a pheasant. But anyway, uh, uh, we disembarked that day. We had to throw our bags over onto a raft. They pulled alongside the ship and had to go down a net on the, along, on the side of the ship on the, uh, to get down to the raft. And it was raining like mad there and when you got to the beach it was just all mud and then when we got to our barracks the barracks were just a, a it was a structure just framed in and they had rails around the side of the building there was no sides of the building you know you see it was all open sides huh. but they had long overhangs so the rain wouldn't come in on with the roof the long eaves and uh, we got in that barracks and it wasn't lit properly it was dark it was raining Floor was muddy. We were muddy. I just so depressed that night. Oh, sure. <laughs> Get a ball, uh -huh. you know. Oh, boy. But uh, we woke up in the morning. The sun come up, and then we start uh, adapting to the waiting for our ship to leave there. And uh, I found a way to beat the bad food. I volunteered for night mess cook. We were there for, for almost sixty days. We were there till J July twenty fourth, just in receiving barracks, just loafing around, no money. Yeah, what would you do with your time? Uh, well, I, I got, uh, went to night mess cooking. Every other okay. night I mess cooked. And I got good food that way. I learned, to, uh, I got to know where the back door was. I could go in the back door every, on the days I didn't work. And, <laughs> and uh, then we had movies. I can remember sitting in the rain with his poncho on, watching a movie. <laughs> and uh, the funny thing about Mary, uh, New building made New Guinea is one minute you could be walking in mud up to your knees, and about two hours later, if the sun come out, you had dust in your eyes. Is that right? Yeah, that's the way it was there. But it, and then uh, every Sunday we'd get a uh, uh, check for two beers. Well, we weren't our payroll wasn't open because we were in in route, and so we weren't getting paid. So well, all those guys were broke. So what we do is we there was another guy that I befriended from Kankakee, Illinois. Oscar Carlson, he and I would take our beer chits and we'd go to the Seabees, there were a lot of Seabees there, and they were on getting paid, so we'd barter our beer chits and maybe get 65, 70, 75 cents. Then we'd go and find some greenhorn to buy their, their chit for a quarter <laughs> and then go and sell the chits until we had enough to buy shaving lotion and toothpaste and stuff like that to get a haircut. <laughs> Well, anyway, 
<laughs> that's the way life was on Milne Bay. And then the June 20, uh, July, it ended July, July 24th. In fact, we, it, it, the, Lur, the ship Lurlin come in and it was going to Brisbane. So we got the Lurlin and uh, we, uh, we were in the draft, went, uh, rode the Lurlin to, to Brisbane and we took a train to Sydney and we spent about a week in Sydney at the Grand Central Hotel. That was a receiving ship there. While I was there, I ended up in a work detail going out to a golf course where they had a ammunition station, uh, arms, uh, ordnance plant underneath the, uh, they had the arms stored underneath the golf greens. Oh, is that right? So we were loading and unloading ammunition there for about a week. Then, uh, uh, well, after a week, we took the train down to Canberra and Mel Melbourne, we got off and we went, got in trucks, and they took us to a center and fed us. There was no diners on these uh, Australian trains. And these Australian trains were these type cars where you had doors on both sides of the compartments, and there was room for about five or six people in a compartment. And there were five of us in this com one compartment we were riding in. I can remember a little guy named Van Wee slept up in a baggage rack, and another small guy, Stahl, was up in a baggage rack. Carlson and Thompson were on the seats, and I drew the short straw. I was laying with my feet under the bunk and my head, head in the head. Oh. <laughs> I was laying on a, oh. my uh, duffel bag, a oh, sea no. bag. And uh, that's where we slept, going across Australia. And then they, uh, as we went across Australia, one thing about Australia, Australia's got five states. And each state owns its own railroad. And there's no two adjoining states with the same gauge rail. So you'd come to the state line, you'd have to unload your baggage and get in another car, and then off you'd go. And uh, then we stopped at Adelaide uh, one day there, and uh, I remember playing ball at the fairgrounds, and then they fed us and we got back on the train. As we went across the desert, they would uh, stop. They had no diner. They would pull out a 50-gallon drum. They had some kindling in one of the cars, and they'd light the drum, cook, coffee, so we'd have hot coffee, but we'd feed us cold bully beef and bread and coffee. Now, bully beef is a form of corned beef, and that was our meal going across. And we left like, I'm thinking we left like on a Friday from Sydney, and we didn't get to Perth till the following Thursday. Oh, so, boy. So it was a rough ride. Oh, but, man. But uh, Australia is, along the coast, it's just a beautiful country. Yeah. Then you get out in the belly of it, and man, it's something you don't want. <laughs> That must have been an experience. I mean, here, once again, here's a boy from Omaha yeah. uh, in exotic places like uh, New Guinea, and now he's traveling across Australia. That must have been uh, yeah. quite an experience. And uh, I'll tell you one thing about the Australians. Like, there's a town called Kalgoorlie. It's a, out near the West End there. It's short, just short of Perth. And uh, that town is famous for it. It's a gold mining town. And they go out and work in the gold mines until noon. And in the afternoon, they drink beer until 6 o'clock. All bars close at 6 o'clock <laughs> So that was that was the kind of life they led in that Calgary. But uh, we got into Perth, and then they picked us up and took us down to Fremantle. That's where the sub base is. I don't know if you remember when Ted Turner and his it was racing these uh, America boats, mm -hmm. the America Cup boats. Uh -huh. They had one race out of Australia. It was right out of the harbor. We worked in right there. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. right there at Fremantle. Yeah. Huh. And. Uh, I eventually got assigned to a relief crew. Now, a relief crew is a crew that overhauls the submarines when they come in. Submarine goes out for patrol, and they last anywhere from 40 to about 80 days. And then they come back in, the crew is taken off, they're sh sent to a rest camp for two weeks while their boat is refitted. And that's what the relief crew does, is refit the boats, fix up anything that went wrong, and uh, they run them in dry dock and uh, strip the uh, hull and paint it. And uh, so I worked on the refit of the Crevelli and the Bluegill while I was in this one submarine division. And then they were going back to the States while I was a Greenhorn out there. So I was transferred to uh, uh, sub, uh, Submarine Division 181 on the, uh, on the tender Uraley. That's uh, the Uraley worked it different than the other division I was in. Since I was a radio man, they put me in the radio shack so I didn't have to work on the boats. So I was in that tender, on that tender, standing radio watches there at Perth, at Fremantle, rather, which is 12 miles from Perth. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
uh, from October till January when I caught the Blenny. Now, Perth is a was a beautiful town. It's on the Swan River, and, and uh, I used to make some liberties there with some of the radio men friends, and we it was just a nice place to be. The people were wonderful down there. They, I don't think you'll ever talk to anybody who's in Australia and say anything bad about the Australian people. They accepted us with open arms. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, and uh, then uh, in January, well, uh, that time of the year, it's summertime down there. I can remember going to Mass at the cathedral with a friend of mine, midnight Mass, and it was 100 degrees that Christmas day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but in January, I got assigned to the Blenny. And uh, when I went aboard the Blenny, I went aboard around January 28th, and on February the 5th, is, we did our shakedowns right there out so off, uh, off of Fremantle. And uh, then I, we left there on uh, February the 5th, and we headed up towards, we were going up to, uh, to French Indochina, Vietnam today, to work around Saigon. And to get there, we had to go through up north through a strait called the Lombok Straits. Lombok is is just it's a part of Indonesia, West New Guinea there, mm -hmm. and it's Bali, Bali or Bali, however you want to pronounce it, is is the island on the west side of the strait, and the Lombok's on the east side of the strait. Now this strait's about 14 or 16 miles long. I don't recall. It's just approximately around that time. Going northbound, you got a five five knot undercurrent going southbound in that strait, so you can't dive because it'll take all your juice to uh, get through there. The strait is only four miles wide, and they had radar control guns on both shore and sides of that strait. So we kind of lay out until nightfall, and we used to say we put everything on propulsion, including the wash machine, which we had. and. Uh, but anyway, we'd run through that straight. It'd take about an hour, hour and a half to get through that straight going north, and it'd only take about 45 minutes going south. But uh, it was always kind of touch and go going through there because you, yeah. you never knew what you were going to run into. But once we got through there, it was pretty good sailing through the Java Sea. And uh, we got up to uh, off Cameron Bay. And uh, I know you didn't want too much technicality, but February 19th, 1944, that was my first death charging. Oh. We, we uh, made an attack on a uh, ship coming up with, it had uh, two or three destroyers, I don't recall right now how many it was, but he had some escorts. And the old man made an attack on him, and incidentally, this water is all shallow water off the coast there. We called 110 feet shallow because he didn't have much there. The boat was built for 600, so <laughs> so you can see that was shallow water. Well, we made the attack, and any submariner from World War II will tell you about the problems we had with torpedoes. Uh, some of them run, run too deep, some of them would broach and explode, some of them would run erratic, and this day the skipper fired and nothing happened, and he was trying to figure out why the torpedoes went underneath. He had it set for six foot, and there was a big tanker going up, and he should have got it. And he was watching through the scope in high power, trying to figure out what happened. And he turned the scope around, and he seen a big blur, and he put it on low power. He actually seen the depth charges being catapulted in the air. In the air. And we were at 60 feet. And that day I was on reload aft, uh, that first run uh, for battle stations uh, submerged, I was on reload aft. And I was standing in the after torpedo room facing aft. On the forward bulkhead of the torpedo room was a sink. And under the sink they had one of these tanks that hooked to the wall to catch the drainage. And then when the drainage the tank was full, they'd take it in the maneuvering room head and dump it. There was a compartment next to it. And then they'd put it back on. Well, anyway, I was facing aft from that first series of torpedoes hit. I never heard anything so loud in my life. Is that, oh. And I'm thinking, oh, I'll never see 41st Avenue again. That's where I lived in Omaha. <laughs> And uh, I looked down, and there was water running over my ankles, and I thought, hell, the, the, the uh, hull is ruptured. So I run into the maneuver room, slammed the hatch, and I said, the maneuvering room is ruptured. I mean, the after torpedo room is ruptured. Look at my feet. 
an old maple little electrician looked through his little sight glass. Ah, oh, get back in there. What happened? It knocked the tank off, and the tank was pouring on my oh, ankles. <laughs> but uh, we were, uh, when that first series went off, the boat broached. And, we, and then we fought to get back down while the guy was making the turn. And we did a lot of maneuvering. As a matter of fact, we went in a silent running, and everybody had to get in line with the uh, bow planes, stern planes, and the helm. They're all hydraulic operated, but when you go in silent running, you shut the hydraulic gear off. So you got to turn those wheels about 10 times to get it degree. So we were, uh, we were in line taking turns with those different wheels, different members of the crew. And uh, we were getting bombarded from about 12.30 in the afternoon till about almost 8 o'clock that night before we come out of it. Wow. Well, you laugh about it now, but it, it had to be a terrifying oh, experience. 135 degrees, you're wringing wet, you're turning that doggone thing, uh, and you, every time you think you're out, there's along come another series of charges, and you, see, you watch the light bulbs <laughs> shatter, but the skipper was able to outmaneuver them, and uh, we were lucky. Mm -hmm. Anyway... Uh, we did sink one ship a couple days later, and uh, we had to go into Subic Bay for a reload on torpedoes. Subic Bay was in the Philippine Islands, and they had just, see, the invasion of the Philippines is October 24th, 44, and they had just opened this advanced base, and they had a subtender griffin in, so we went in alongside the griffin, and I will never forget that because... A lot of the guys I went overseas with were assigned to the Griffin. I went the other way. Oh, is way. that right? And I was loading the boat, and they were up there yelling Votro. That's what my nickname there. And uh, it was kind of like a homecoming. And I was I remember I was helping load the torpedoes, and I was talking to one guy in particular, Walt Stein. I don't know what ever happened to him, but I remember that. Why I remember, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we loaded the boat. And while we were loading the torpedoes, we had a red alert because they were still fighting at Manila. So we had to get away from the tender, and uh, we uh, anchored out in the bay. We did have all our two torpedoes on. The next morning, we left and I went back to Subic. There were three great experiences I really remember. I think were pretty close calls. One of them happened on March 19th of 1944. That, that day... I was, uh, that first run, I was standing watches on the helm and sound gear. If I was, we were on surface, I'd r operate the helm and look at it, it'd be a, a periscope lookout. When we were submerged, I was on the helm, I mean on the sound gear in the conning tower. And uh, this morning, I was sitting on the sound there, I don't recall who was on the helm, I remember Gelly was a quartermaster. And this, the, uh, what we would do most generally, at six o'clock or dawn, every morning, we'd come in close to the beach. We'd, at night, we'd go out a ways and charge our engines. In daytime, we'd come in close to the beach and dive, and we'd trim the boat. And then we'd stay down all day, watching the ships running up and down the coast, right in close to the beach. And we'd come in close to the beach that morning, and we made our trim dive was apparently during the night, as lookouts were going up and down, somebody hit the wheel on the hatch, and Gally, the quarterback, the uh, master never checked it before we and made our trim dive. Uh, anyway, when they called to clear the bridge, they come down real fast. He died within about 30, 40 seconds. Really? Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. You see, you're running... <clears throat> You're running the submarine rig for dive. It's just like running a milk bottle upside down in water. You got the floods open at the bottom, and then... That's what you're, the way you ride out at sea. And then when you dive, you just open the vents, and that all fills up real fast, see? And uh, anyway, when they cleared the bridge, as, anyway, as uh, during the night, somebody hit that wheel, and the, the dogs come in on the hatch. And when the galley pulled that ha hatch down, it wouldn't go around the lip of the, of the hatch, so he couldn't secure the hatch. So we let the hatch go back up, and he went up to open it up. By that time, the water was coming in this 24-inch hatch. Well, half the South China Sea come in the blenny that night. Oh, boy. And I was in the conning tower. The skipper and I closed the hatch to the c control room, and uh, by the time the chief of the boat was able to get the dive reversed to where we surfaced, 
We had water about uh, waist high in that uh, conning tower. But the damage was done. The flood, the, the pump room was flooded. The uh, compressors were out. The pumps were out. The you know, some of the water went out down through a drain in the, uh, the periscope into the radio shack, and the transmitter was out in the radio shack. Well, after we got up and got the hatch closed, we got uh, we went back down. We uh, we dove again, and we ran down. It submerged all day. But we were working on all the damage that was done. The guys, uh, the auxiliary men, were in the pump room washing out all the salt water, all out the electrical parts, and washing it out with clear water and let it dry. And and we were doing the same with the radio shack. And it took us about a day or two. No air conditioning. Hotter, oh, hotter than Hades down. Humid, probably. Yeah. Oh. And uh, we finally got things going. And a couple of days later, there was a convoy that came up the coast that. Uh, there was had three ships and four escorts. And the old man was able to get in ahead of the escorts, between the escort and the ships, <laughs> and he caught overlapping bows on the three ships. He fired four torpedoes. We sunk two ships and damaged one. There was, they were big uh, tenders, uh, tankers. They were about 10,000 ton tanker, tankers. And uh, he turned around, went right underneath the destroyer out to sea, we sunk two ships that day. Her depth charge is off in the distance. We didn't get hurt. The day, a couple days, a month earlier, we missed the ship and got the heck yeah, kicked yeah. out of it. Uh. So anyway, that run was pretty much over. So we went into Subic and we had a refit there. Then when we, the Blenny started its third run, my second. Now, when you do a refit, would you be able to get off? And, yeah, and we do. The crew, right. regular crew would leave. The yeah. only people that stay on were the people that are being transferred back to re she got back to the relief crew. See, see what they try to do is give people breaks so they weren't on them all the time. Yeah. And uh, they uh, transfer off probably about 20% of the crew each, after each run to take on new people. That way you kept people qualified and you give guys rest. But anyway, uh, after, well, Subic Bay had a rest camp. It was, it was a Quonset hut and you had the bay to swim in if you wanted to swim in the oil, but it was, we had played a little ball and stuff like that around. Just got away from the regular duties. Yeah. And then uh, our next run started right after. Well, we were we were doing our shakedowns when Frank Rose, Franklin Roosevelt died. That, you got, you uh, got that, word word of that? Uh, we we come in from a sh uh, from our training, be getting ready for the third run when when Franklin Roosevelt died. Yeah. How was uh, how was the oh, mood on the ship and? I tell you what, if I can remember who in the hell is Truman. Oh, is that right? Yeah. That was the question. Huh. I mean, we didn't know who he yeah, was out yeah. there. You know, you were kind of detached for the election out sure. there. Sure. And uh, but anyway, uh, people were didn't know what to think really uh, with Truman in there. But anyway, we went out and made our patrol. And uh, we went up to uh, the Tonkin Gulf, and we were on lifeguard duty that time, just riding around waiting for some uh, a flyer to be shot down. And uh, you know, the submarines rescued George Bush. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, submarine uh, Finback rescued him, and that's what we were on. We were on. We were on lifeguard duty that particular run. Coming back down, we uh, our first half of the run was to be up there, and and. Uh, Coming back to the Fisubic to get some fuel to head down south, we uh, were going past a little island called Pratus Island. They had a radio tower on there. So the old man decided he'd shoot it up. Well, we had to go about <laughs> two miles onto shallow water, on a kind of a shallow base where we couldn't dive to, to, to reach the, fire, the uh, radio tower. But we fired 105 uh, rounds. We knocked uh, some of the parts off the radio tower. We could see some Using damage. your top gun? We, or, had, or, we had two 5-inch 25s, and we had two 40 millimeters on that submarine. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, we uh, uh, did some damage to that, and then we went on into Subic refuel, and we went down through the Java Sea, down to the Java Sea, and we, the old man got word that there were two sub-chasers in, uh, in a little harbor off Banjo Mason. And it was, you had to <clears throat> go up about 10 miles of shallow water in a river to get to this harbor. Wow. So what the old man did is he blew the boat up as high as he could. He, he 
fill the tanks with air and get as high as you could. And we were taking lead line readings as we backed up this river. We backed up on our motors. We didn't have our engines running, we were on our electric motors. And as soon as he come into the harbor and he got in range, he fired the after tubes, got four fish off, and then immediately they fired off the diesels and we start running down there that river to get back to deep wow. water. And we got two hits, we sunk both the sub chasers. And uh, then uh, as we were in the Java Sea, we run across a, a, a cargo ship and we sunk it and we took some prisoners. Really? Uh, we had a, the skipper was a Japanese skipper, but some of the crew were Japanese. We had, I think it was five people we took aboard. The rest of them we put in, they had some boats that they put them in and sent them to the beach. And uh, then we headed down for Perth, back through the dug on uh, Lubbock Straits, back into Perth. And we got back into Perth on June 5th and uh, turned the prisoners over to the Marines. We had a shiny, nice clean boat inside. We had the prisoners shining all our brass work. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we had empty torpedo racks and we bed them down in the empty torpedo racks in the forward room. Then we got to Perth, well, we had our, our regular rest leave at the, uh, we had a rest leave at the uh, King Edward Hotel in Perth. And we had two weeks of freedom, just running, doing a little on, drinking beer. That Australian beer was good stuff. <laughs> And uh, then we started our fourth run on the fifth, uh, the fourth run of the boat, my third run, mm -hmm. on the 5th of July. And the funniest thing I ever seen in the Navy, we had a guy, a guy on the boat by the name of John Graham. He was a first class auxiliary man, a motor machine's mate, but he was auxiliary, auxiliary man. And he was up for chief. And we are getting ready to sail. It's a rainy morning in, in Perth, Australia, which is in the wintertime down there in July. The water was running high in the river, and John Graham wasn't aboard. So the skipper said, well, he's just going to be AWOL, and he's going to have to pay the penalty. So we go to swing our stern out in the river, but the river was, we were facing north, the river running south. We couldn't get our stern out because the water was coming down so heavily. So they called in the motor launch to pull our stern out, and lo and behold, the line broke, and the line got wrapped around our screws, so we had to get a diver. Now, we were supposed to leave at, at 9 o'clock in the morning, or 0900, and heck, it was getting on about 11.30, and we were just getting ready to go, and we just pulled our stern out, and the bow was up against the next boat. The taxi cab pulled up on the dock, and here gets John Graham in a blue bathroom getting out of the Dalgon taxi cab. He run across and hopped on the stir. He never made chief, I'll tell you. <laughs> but he, he did make the boat. But I, I just can't believe that a guy would be that lax. Anyway, we pulled out and uh, went up through Lumbach. And as we were going through Lumbach, we found a, uh, a small craft. It was you know, some sort of small ship off of Lumbach and we sunk it with a torpedo. Then we went through the Lumbach Straits and uh, as we were going through the, stra uh, through the Java Sea, we were uh, just kind of re making reconnaissance through there. We, uh, we come across a gunboat and we sunk it. And there was a, there was a, the escort that he had, he would give us a chase for a while. And we had a running gun battle across that Java Sea for a while. And the old man, I, and later he was talking to the old man, he says, that's one day he should have dove, but he didn't, but they missed us anyway. And then we had to get up to the uh, Malaysian coast, uh, the coast of Malaysia. It seems that the big ships were disappearing. And they found out that the Japanese were sending a lot of contraband down the coast to Singapore to try to shore up Singapore. That was one of their bases, Singapore, at that time. That's where a lot of their ships are coming out of. And they were, so we were told to sink these junks, but not to harm the Jap the Chinese that were operating them, because they were under Japanese control. So. Yeah, yeah. So what we'd have to do is we'd pull alongside of the these junks 
go aboard, and if there was a lot of contraband, we'd take the Chinese aboard and put them in our forward torpedo room under guard, sink the junk, and go on to the next one. And uh, that was probably the toughest run we made uh, because we were at battle stations, gun action, most of that run. Hmm. Um, I forgot something. Can I go back? Oh, sure, by all means. Yeah. Uh, as we were going to the stations, going through the Java Sea, our number two main motor went haywire. That's the electric motor. So we had to lay down on the bottom of the Java Sea for about 35 hours while the electricians worked on that boat. We were laying right on the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were totally inert as far as power going out other than electric power for the lights. But they rewound that motor we did some work to the motor to get it going, and then we got back uh, in action. But then, uh, then we went on up to Malaysia. We sunk that after we fixed the motor. We sunk that gunboat. Then we, then we went on up to Malaysia, and we were sinking these junks. And uh, then when we run across a junk that didn't have much contraband, they throw the contraband off, put all the Chinese on, gotcha. and send them back into the beach. And then there was a submarine cod, and they put five men on a junk, and a, in a, uh, they were in our short, uh, just a short ways away from us, and a plane come in on, on this, so they dove. And then while they were down, a, a, a destroyer come in the area, probably led there by the a Japanese destroyer, probably led there by a plane contact, and these five guys were on there. And then when the skipper surfaced, all he remembered was that the junk he had him on was pa had patched sail. Well, wouldn't you know, every sub, every junk in the, around there, there were a lot of junks that floated around there, had patched sails. So he couldn't find his crew, so he put out, that was on August 1st, he put out a warning, uh, an alert to the, all the skippers in the area. Well, we were going about our business, and this one day we were submerged coming along this junk, inside this junk, the old man wanted to look it over before he pulled along to the surface and pulled alongside of it. And he seen the Americans on it. So we surfaced and took these sailors aboard. And uh, in later years, these guys become good friends because one of them lived right there in Omaha. And I... Is that right? Uh, yeah, I was at a meeting with him one night down at, at the, the Alpha Air Force Base Submarine Veterans Meeting. And he, he asked me if I... Uh, I told him I was on the Blenny. And he, he says, the Blenny? He says, they picked us up. And I, I remember conversing with the guys in the mess hall, and this one guy was from Missouri Valley, Iowa, and I said, you're the guy from Missouri Valley, Missouri Valley Iowa, and he said, yeah, that's I'll be he's John Babbitt. Huh. But anyway, uh, we caught the, found them, and we uh, took them uh, over, well, we rendezvoused with the cod that night, and, and uh, transferred them by Breach's Boy, that's where you put a line across each, you have a block on each, a block and tackle on, hooked each boat, and then you swing them across. And then we took their ammunition because they were going back. We were taking ammunition from everybody. We fired over 300 rounds of five-inch ammunition that run. The wow. Bloody set a record that run. We sunk 63 small wow. craft. But we were at battle stations, gun action most of the time. And uh, so we had three, uh, I had three successful patrol runs and we went, uh, we left back to go back, oh, August the 6th. Mm. I was on radio watch that night, and we we had just surfaced, and uh, I'm copying press. A. B. Green uh, was on the, the uh, Wolfpack frequency on the circuit, and I'm copying press, and then the press comes over is about this big bomb, the equivalent of two thousand tons of TNT that was dropped on Hiroshima. And uh, I looked at that message and it says 2,000 tons, that can't be right. 2,000 times 2,000, just this isn't right. Yeah. So I put the message up and I told Green, Greeny about it, my partner. I said, this thing isn't right, it's got this bomb 2,000 tons. Uh, I'm gonna wait for a repeat. Well, a repeat never came within an hour, so I took the message up to the old man on the deck, up on the bridge. And he says, Skipper, I says, uh, this message come over, I said, but it's an error. I said, it says 2,000 tons of TNT. Skipper looked at it, he says, well, son, it is an error. He says, it should be 20,000 tons of TNT. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. 
So I copied the message you that on that first atomic bomb we come over huh. that was sunk. The next day was April, August the seventh. That was our skipper's birthday. Incidentally, on August the eighth, sixth was the day the last submarine was sunk. The bullhead was sunk off Bali, Bali, and on that was one of my buddies from New London, Connecticut, a guy mm. by the name of uh, uh, Bob Patterson. Yeah, he was some in second. But anyway, on the seventh. We were, it was Skipper's birthday, he was 33 years old that day, and so we had a little party in the mess hall while we were submerged. And after the, the little get-together, about 11.30 in the morning, the Skipper says, well, we better get up there and get back to work, and, and uh, the SJ radar man says, well, we got a pip on the radar. He says, well, that's probably land. We were right off the beach there, a short ways, uh, maybe 10 miles. And, and so we sur surfaced, and when they opened the hatch, the skipper, was, he go, went out the hatch, he was always the first one out. As he opened the hatch, he heard this roar, and he looked up, and he seen the plane coming down on us. I got the logs on this. I, oh, I mean, geez. I can prove all this. Wow. The plane coming down on us, and he actually seen the two bombs in the air, but the guy missed us by about 100 yards of starboard. That's oh. how close we come oh, to being the last boat sunk. <laughs> so we got back down, <laughs> and... Uh, so we were, the skipper was a little more careful on the pips after that. But then it was uh, August the 7th, and we left back to go back to Subic. Our run was over, and we got back into Subic on the 14th, and uh, we went out the morning of the 15th for our sound test before we went to rest camp, and that's when we found out the war was over, and the skipper turned on the yellow smoke makers, and we went in the harbor, blowing the whistle <laughs> with the smoke makers going. And, it was kind of a joyous day. Yeah, it must have been the and, relief that, that you'd made it. Yeah, yeah. and uh, well, I can remember the night that we come in on the 14th, being in a conversation with the uh, our executive officer, Mr. Kello, who just died here a couple months ago, and uh, the chief of the boat, Nazy, and they were talking about, uh, boy, the next one's going to be it. They, they, were, they were closing in on the submarines. You see, the whole purpose of the war, when the war started, all the battle was right close to Hawaii or in that area, vicinity down south, mm -hmm. you know, and nobody was getting to Japan, so the only thing, the only ones getting to Japan was the submarines. We were over in the you Sea of China, right. China Sea, and off the Sea of Japan, and we were fighting a war of attrition. Little, little is it known that 56% of the shipping sunk, Japanese shipping sunk, was sunk by submarines. They sunk more than the Navy shore, uh, Navy surface uh, craft and the Air Force did. Mm. In, the, in Japan, I'm not yeah, talking right. about the European part. Right. We sunk over 5 million tons of shipping, but it was little, little was known of that. But they were sinking, that's why, that's why Japan they didn't have oil for their ships at the end of the war because we sunk all those tenders, you know, those oil tankers yeah. going up and down. Well, uh, along those lines, talking uh, figures and such, didn't the submariners, percentage-wise, take the most casualties of the war? Yeah, we uh, had about twenty-five, about twenty to twenty-five percent. We had thirty-five hundred and five people lost out of about fifteen thousand people. Now, did you ever? Were you aware of that? I mean, you'd said earlier that. Something about the submarines really attract you were attracted to it. Did, no. did, were you ever aware that of the, of the losses? At the, time, at the time I saw that movie up there in Madison, Wisconsin, they had only lost twelve submarines. Okay. And uh, I thought, hell, that's pretty safe. Okay. But boy, then when we start getting towards shallow water, we were getting out of our element, and they were catching. Well, when you're in shallow water, you're just not in a submarine's element. That's all. Right. Too. Okay. Yeah, and just, there were 52 boats lost. Hmm. Well, that was the last of them. Hmm. I have... I, when I was in the sub -ba at the sub-base, there was a fellow by the name of Bobby Lee, Robert Peter Lee, out of, out of uh, uh, Newport, Rhode Island. He was on the Tang. He's, he's still on patrol. Georgie Kaplavka, out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Good friend. We all went on liberties. He got married the last weekend we were at sub-base. He's still on patrol on the Albacore. Nate Kelly. When still, you say uh, still on patrol, lost at sea. Lost at oh, sea. Oh, jeez. Uh, 
Nate Kelly's on the albacore, and there's a kid named H Hagen that's on the scamp. They they were all in my comp in my training group. Uh, Lee Kaplaska and Patterson, Peter, uh, yeah, Bob Patterson. Those four guys, three guys, and myself, we were we run together. So I'm the only one left out of the whole. Jeez, uh, wow. So I get kind of emotional when I talk about. Oh it. yeah, understandable, understandable. Can you can you talk a little bit about? Ordinary life in a sub, what it's like, uh, uh, the conditions, the food, sleeping. What, oh, the, uh, talk the, about life in the sub. I'm fascinated by this. Well, your your food is probably the best. We had steaks and hams as long as the supply lasts. After the after the supply runs out, if your patrol lasts too long, then you're digging out the canned tuna and the canned goods from behind the airlines and stuff like that. But we had frozen. We had a freezer on board. Huh? We had a uh, baker that baked every night. We had fresh bread every night, and uh, well, you, it's it's air conditioned normally, so it's rather comfortable. When you're submerged too long, the air gets kind of uh, bad, to where you can't. I remember they allow a smoking lamp every two hours, and it got so bad to show you how stupid people are. The air got so bad you couldn't light a lighter because the flame wouldn't flame, so they had a little electric. Lighters to light your cigarettes with, and the air is so bad that you. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, well, we like one half run. Uh, everybody got to take a turn to either mess cook or what, or, or uh, washing machine. I had the washing machine half of the second run. It was good duty because they everybody paid in fifty cents a week for the laundry, and half of it went to the ship's fund, and half went to the guy doing the washing. So I got extra pay for doing it. And that was the only duty I had. I just, all night long, I'd wash clothes. I'd get one washing machine full of fresh water because fresh water was, that was really uh, uh, Premium. Great, uh, something that you had to take care of on a submarine because those batteries had to have fresh water. And they got first priority. Now, would you produce your own fresh water? Or was yeah, we had stills on them. Oh, okay, okay. This is why we may, uh, took and boiled the... Uh, Sea water and got fresh water. It was good enough to be put in the batteries. Okay. But then we had drinking water and cooking water. But for showers, we used to just get the condensation water from the air conditioner. We get a half a bucket. So we take our washcloth, get ourselves a little wet, and then we soap it, soap ourselves down and use the rest of the water for rinse. Huh. We get that twice a week. And. Uh, but anyway, I used to get a uh, uh, washing machine full of fresh water, and uh, then I'd use the uh, condensating water for uh, for rinse. But I'd wash all the clothes first, put it in the sink, then I'd drain the soapy water and put it in rinse water, and then rinse it. And that's the only way you could do it. We had, but your clothes, they weren't perfect, but they were pretty decent. Then I'd take them in the engine room and hang them on the rails and alongside the engines to dry, you know. And I'd, like, I'd wash the forward torpedo room one night, after torpedo room another night, the after battery where the crew lived, uh, also part of the crew lived another night. Then I'd wash the officers and chiefs another night, and uh, then I had the bedding that I'd wa wash on a certain night. I don't remember just what the schedule is anymore, but it, it was all worked out. And uh, then they had guys doing mess cooking. They had two of the greener guys on the submarine that would... Uh, uh, wash dishes and, and set up the tables and peel the potatoes. That's, uh, towards the end of the run, we'd be out of, you see, when you went out to sea, you had a pretty good supply of fresh milk and, and fresh vegetables. But after four or five days, that was all gone. So you were out of, you were on powdered milk. Fortunately, on submarine, we did have the soft ice cream maker. You know, that, that right? soft, uh, like Dairy Queen. Uh -huh. We were the ones, the first, they were the first ones to get that during the war, the submarines. And our skipper was a ice cream hound, so we had plenty of ice cream powder on board. We dumped the powder in water and mixed it. And, and uh, I can remember after the war, we were uh, we went to Guam. I didn't get out until January until uh, February of '44. I, I didn't have enough points, so I had to stay with the, I stayed with the Blenny, and we went from uh, we didn't come back to the states. We went to Guam. And we made a trip down to Man down to the uh, Manus Islands, down to uh, well Manus Islands, and then back up, just a kind of a goodwill trip, a training trip, 
back to Guam, and then we didn't leave Guam until the middle of uh, July, January, and come back to San Diego at the end of January, and on the 15th of January, I left for discharge in St. Louis, and I was discharged February 22nd. A 46? A 46. Okay. Uh -huh. But uh, I can remember when I was in Guam, my cousin's husband was uh, a chaplain's assistant in the Navy, and he was there at Guam, and he found out the blending was in, so he came down to see me. Is that right? And uh, poor old Pete was on K rations and C rations for lunch so long, he didn't know what real food was. So I says, uh, can you stay for lunch? He says, sure. So I told Lynn to cook. I says, I'm going to have a guest. Well, we had fried chicken and <laughs> all the fixings and ice cream and apple pie. It got to a point where the guys quit eating, uh, some readers quit eating, and they were watching Pete eat because he, he hadn't seen real food for so long. He, he just dove in. I think he had th uh, probably half a chicken in, or <laughs> most of a chicken himself. And, and boy, he, he really uh, celebrated it. And when I got back home, the only first thing I heard is, Pete tells us you guys really eat well. <laughs> <laughs> How big was the crew on? Uh, there was uh, 73 enlisted men and eight officers. And I, I, I'm still going back to conditions on the, on the ship. I, I'm just fascinated yeah. by this. I mean, you did had, you feel crowded? I mean, was it... Uh, well, you, you, you didn't have a place to dance, but you did get around. I mean, uh, do you do any traveling ever? Yeah. yeah. Do you ever get up in the Wisconsin area? I've never. That's one part of the country I've never been. If you ever yeah. get up to Manitowoc, there's a fleet boat in the, in the condition of a regular sailing boat. It's ready to go to sea. That's one that you can go aboard and see what it's like. But uh, it's 308 feet long, 24 foot wide. And then you got these saddle tanks in that 24, that's included in that 24 feet. So you got the inner hull, which is around sewer pipe, I call it. <laughs> and then you got these saddle tanks around the side of it that makes the 24 feet. Well, so inside you probably, probably the width of that dining room would be 12, 14 feet maybe. But uh, in the forward torpedo room, you've got uh, 24 torpedoes. You've got six torp torpedoes in the tubes. You don't have 24 in the forward torpedo room. You have six torpedoes in the, uh, in the tubes and 10 reloads. That's, that's 16 torpedoes forward, and then you carry eight aft. So we had 24 torpedoes. But our bunks were right alongside the torpedoes going from top uh, on up. They had some slid out from under the torpedo racks. and. They had two of those, two, four, six, eight. They had eight of those up front in the forward torpedo room. Then we had two, two, three, four, five, six. We had, uh, it was either six or eight bunks above the torpedoes. I guess it was eight bunks above the torpedo. My, torp my bunk most of the time was above the forward to above the torpedo on the starboard side of board the, above the, uh, the, the explosive head there. The head of the torpedo. Uh, that was a good bunk. Tell me about that fan. Oh, we had fans at the base of our bunks to circulate a little bit, little fans. And I used to stick my a restless sleeper. I used to stick my bunk, uh, my toes in the fan. I had black toes. <laughs> oh, geez. And another thing, I'd I'd uh, hit my arms on the cork bulkhead and end up with skin to elbows, you know. But ah, that's part of living. And then the officers' quarters, they had their boardroom, they had uh, their, there was bunk space for eight, bu eight of them. And uh, then the chief's quarters was in the part of in the uh, forward battery also, and they, they had room for six or eight chiefs. I, I don't think we had that many chiefs, so we, a couple of first class were allowed to sleep in there. Then the after battery, there was room for Three, six, nine, twelve, twenty-four, uh, twenty-four, three, six, nine, eighteen. Uh, twenty-four, eighteen. That'd be forty-three, right? Uh, tw uh, forty-two. Uh, room for forty-two in the after battery, and then room for a few more to sleep in the after, after torpedo room. Hmm. Then you had two engine. Well, the uh, the, uh, the control room that. After part of the control room, there was a little cubicle. That's where the radio shack was. And right on the other side, in the next compartment, was the kitchen, the galley. And we had room to seat uh, 
six, eight, twelve, twenty-four. No, six, twelve, twenty-four people could eat at one time. So there were eat in shifts. Yeah, there yeah. were at least three shifts in the of the cruise mess uh, for the crew. The officers had two uh, stewards mates that used to come back get our get the food from our kitchen and they take it up and then they'd serve it on. We, well, we had plates. We, I'll tell you one thing about submarines. Uh, I can remember the first morning I was on a submarine, I, I come in to eat breakfast and the cook asked me how I wanted my eggs and I thought, oh, who's pulling my leg here? <laughs> and so I said, well, sunny side up, by God, that's the way I got Is that it. Right, I mean, yeah. it, it was just, it was good cooked food and you got it the way you wanted it. And breakfast was pretty much served uh, if they were having eggs, you get your eggs fried the way, but you had the rest of the meal that was set up beforehand. And uh, then in the after the after the crew quarters, you had your shower on one side and two heads on the other side. And uh, then after the, after that, you had the two engine rooms. And then you had the maneuvering room. That's where they had the controllers for controlling the speed of the ship and. And uh, down in the lower portion was where they had the four main motors. You see, when your submarine was propelled by four diesel engines that turned four generators, and the generators went to a box, and this electricity went to a box that you could either put it straight to propulsion, well, you had to put it to the engines. I'm getting, uh, w uh, you could either put it to the batteries to charge your batteries from the engines, these generators, or you could put it to the uh, motors, and the motors had reduction gears with the props, two, uh, two screws and sticking out the back. Now, we had an auxiliary diesel underneath the deck of the after engine room. Oftentimes, if we were trying to get uh, charged at night, we would uh, put two engines on propulsion, or maybe one engine on propulsion, and two engines on charge and uh, if we were chasing somebody at four using all four engines we would use that auxiliary to carry a zero float in our batteries to, to put, keep our batteries up as we were going so we wouldn't draw any so we had full batteries when we mm -hmm. submerged but those engines had to be run from those generators you know, those motors had to be run from those generators and uh, then you had the after torpedo room had four torpedoes aft but the quarters weren't big. If you have four torpedo room, four battery control room, uh, after battery, two engine rooms, maneuvering room, that's eight compartments in 300 yeah, and eight right, feet. Right. You're getting down pretty short on your length of your compartments. Did, did uh, claustrophobia ever play into you at all, or uh... it never did then? But I don't think I could hack it today. Yeah. 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 And what about the long periods of time when you'd be submerged? At, uh... Uh, when they, if the air got too bad, they'd put out what they call CO2 absorbent. They'd take a, one of the bunks in the, the, each compartment and they'd uh, take the mattress off and put it on another bunk and they'd stretch a sheet over the, the bunk part, you know, the spring. And then they'd sprinkle the CO2 absorbent on and then they'd bleed oxygen into the boat. And that CO2 absorbent, it'd get more hotter than heck underneath there because it was clearly terrifying the air as huh. air passed through it. Wow, wow. wow. How, how were things as far as, uh, you know, you were talking about getting word about uh, Roosevelt and the A-bomb. Were, were you getting news or were you cut off from the rest of the world oh, when no, you guys no, were out? No, no, no. We used to get, on the radio, that's, we used to have what they called schedules, scheduled uh, transmissions. Honolulu used to transmit the, the boats up around Japan. When we were working out of Australia. We were catching the schedules out of a, a Perth, Australia. It was VIX Zero. And uh, that's what I was copying most of the time. Green was my partner. He was on the uh, circuit working with the boats in the area. I was copying the skeds. And they would be putting out all this information about what was going on in the world, giving us all the intelligence would uh, get their reports to us through these schedules, telling us what to look for, okay. where to look for it. Uh -huh. And uh, we'd copy these skeds, and, and uh, then at night, uh, they'd have a certain amount of press. Well, that's what the boat would rely on. 
every night I'd copy a sheet of plain language press that told them what was going on in the world and put it out in the control room and everybody, as the day went on, people come by and look at, that's okay. how we kept up on it. That's how I got that right, release right. on the, the bomb. Did you have any concept whatsoever uh, the size of this, this bomb? When, no, uh, they, you know, they it, never it, knew what an atom was yeah, until yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, it was just mind-boggling. Yeah, yeah. What about uh, communications from home? I mean, I imagine you, only well, when you got back to base, would you get... Uh, we'd get a stack of letters yeah. uh, when we got back to base, and we'd write a few while we were back in. And, uh, back in those days, they had what they called V-mail. It was a form where you just write your letter on the ba uh, front part of it, then it would fold up into an envelope. Of course, everything was censored. Yeah. So you're one of the, you never sealed anything. One of the officers on the boat would censor it. And uh, my mother told me sometimes they got confetti, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, then they'd, what they'd do with this uh, V-mail, they would picture it. They'd take a uh, picture of it and they'd just send a little co uh, tele uh, photostatic copy of it. They'd reduce it. It wasn't yeah. the same size. You remember those? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how we did, did that. And then when I come back home, I, I got home on a Saturday, the day after George Washington's birthday. I was you you it, remember what that was like coming home and well, the homecoming? Yeah, well, my mother was the only one home. Nobody, they, well, they didn't know I was coming. Right, was, yeah. My uh, dad was working for the railroad. That was still a six-day week. That was before they went on a 40-hour work week. And uh, mother was the only one home. And, Dog well, that was the dog let me in. That it was daylight then, but uh, they'd gotten the dog while I was in the service. Went out with the guys a couple nights later. I couldn't get in the house. I had to throw rocks at the front door to get in the house. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, then as the people come home, we were all happy to see each other. And naturally, I made the trip around to see all the relatives, aunts and uncles. And, and uh, but uh, I. The first Monday home, uh, I went down and got my driver's license. I didn't have a car, but I got the driver's license and did uh, register in with the register, with the registrar, the county officers. You give you turn in your, they take a picture of your uh, discharge and give it back to you. And uh, then the next day, I went down to Swift and Company and got a job on a loading dock down there. No time off, just... Uh... Well, I thought I'd get in on something, but they were trying to break OPA then, the Office of Price Administration, so I'd work a couple of weeks, get laid off a couple of weeks, and heck, they were tra transferring me around from one department to another. So I finally went to work for a hog syrup manufacturing company in South Omaha. I worked there for a couple of years, and I went to work for the railroad in 49, and uh, started out throwing mail bags, unloading uh, mail cars there at the terminal the railroad and uh, then eventually I went out to be a yard clerk well I worked in the ticket office there at the depot in Omaha for a while selling tickets and then I worked in the yards and I finally got to be night agent there at Omaha for a number of years and then in about 1969 I bid into the general office and then they after that they promoted me to uh, manager of a disbursement accounting and then I got transferred to Denver in 1974 and they at that time they transferred me it made me the regional manager of, uh, of uh, stations uh, I was in charge of all the station agents for on the whole Denver region it was such a good job I stayed with it till I retired they bought me off in 82 so I've been retired since the end of 82 right? yeah yeah since the end of 82 can I back up and ask you uh your parents, particularly your mom, after the war, did she talk about uh, about what she was going through during that time? You know, you said she she's upset my, when you left, and, and particularly with you know what, the service you were in and the fact that you know communications would be months apart. Did she ever talk about uh, her thoughts or her feelings? She never divulged them to me. The only time she ever revealed that she was worried was when my brother was drafted during the Korean crisis, 
and he went into the paratroopers. Mm. And she says, my God, what, do I do? what did I do to deserve this? One goes under the sea and one goes in the air. Yeah. <laughs> so that told me that she was worried. Yeah. 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 But that's the only time I ever heard her make a remark. She kind of kept it to a lot of that to herself. Just like I say, she wouldn't go to the depot that first time. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. She stayed home and cried. Yeah, right. And my yeah. dad told me that. <laughs> yeah. And dad, he was, well, I remember when I wrote back from the... Uh, from uh, Madison, Wisconsin, to tell Dad, to tell them I was uh, volunteering for submarines. Well, Dad got, he was working for the railroad. He got a pass and he was up there that following weekend. <laughs> what in the hell do you want to go to submarines? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Well, we'll, uh, we'll start to wind down this interview. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about any stories. Dolores, is there anything that you can think of? That well, the only thing I would say is ask him about the, how they fuel the cabs in Australia. Oh, in Australia during the war, they had, they were short of petrol just like everybody else. They would start their engines down there with gas, gasoline, but they had charcoal burners in the back end of the, in the trunk. And they would fire up these charcoal burners and uh, as soon as they got the engines running, then they switched to the gas from the charcoal engine. No, no pep in these. If you were a fair and they were going up a hill, you'd probably end up getting out and pushing them <laughs> up the hill, you know. And one time I remember <clears throat> we had a Liberty. We were on the wrestling, and the, the guy's fire went out, and he was out, out in some suburban, some urban area, and uh, we needed some wood. And I remember John Beatty, who's still a good friend. He's Dying. He's uh, got Alzheimer's down in Arizona now. John Beatty and myself and another guy, we took a couple pickets off some guy's fence. <laughs> we needed wood. <laughs> uh, have you ever had a chance to travel back to any of the places you were stationed? Australia, New Guinea, any of those? Uh... I never got back overseas, but I've been back to the sub bay. I was up to uh, Farragut in 85 when I went to a convention in, uh, in uh, Portland, and I... For as big a base as it was, the only thing left there now is the old brick building. And the reason the brick building is there is because it's uh, the uh, Idaho uh, Wildlife Commission used it to store their nets and stuff for that lake there. Hmm. And it was a cement block building. All the rest were plywood buildings. But there's nothing there, but there's still roads. And I was able to, t to show her where the camp was. There used to be six Olympics-type swimming pools up there because they, everyone had a... Uh, it's a uh, field house, you know, and they had a swimming pool in every one of them, every camp. They're all covered up. Oh, God. Huh. And then I I went back to New London. Well, I went to stop by the University of Wisconsin when we had a convention in Milwaukee and uh, saw where my old stomping grounds were there, got to see the old stadium, and, and uh, things have changed, but I could find my way around then. Then I went uh, back to New London, Connecticut, when we, they commissioned in Nebraska. We got an invitation there. Oh, I didn't tell you, we sunk the Blenny uh, for an artificial reef in uh, 1949 off the, off the coast of... Uh, 1989, off the coast, oh, uh, off the coast of uh, uh, Ocean City, Maryland. It's uh, sunk for an artificial reef. That's a... That's a locker, my locker, number 12 in the forward to appeal. I'll be darned. You, they, went, you, they, you went back for, for the sinking? or were Yeah, you just... I went back. We, we were all invited back for the sinking. Boy, talk about rolling out the red carpet. We got more lobster and crab than you can think, dream about, you know, and, and uh, big parties. Mind. Oh, it was just a great party. It took us out in fishing boats about... Uh, Earlier, you asked me about whether I was seasick or not. And yeah. I mentioned something about. My oh, okay. Wife. You can tell this story. Uh, we had, went out in fishing boats, and uh, we had went out about ten miles out to where they were going to sink it. See, well, the boat had been cannibalized for parts yeah. over uh -huh. the years, and uh, uh, we were out there, and I'm eating a nice big crab sandwich, you know. Yeah, but tell them about the squall that came up. Well, it was a little, I guess there was a squall, it was raining, and, and the sea was choppy, but uh, I'm enjoying a nice sandwich, and she said, you have to eat that damn thing in front of me. She, she was feeding the fish over the side. Yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't alone, even the news people. Oh, there, was, there were a lot of people who were seasick, but, you know, it, it, I worked the same way on that thing for about 
15, 20, 30 minutes, I was kind of queasy, and then I come out of it, and then I'm fine. Huh. But that's the way I was, even after we come back to the boat after a rest leave. If go out the first night, day, I was a little bit queasy for, oh, a couple hours, maybe, you at the most. You still have that tape somewhere. Uh, we'll get off this if you want to stay. I think I got it, can find, maybe I can find the tape I got. It's a, it's a short tape that this officer uh, it's confiscated some of the uh, 16 millimeter t tape we had. Oh, is that right? Oh, wow. And uh, it's it's rough. I mean, yeah. uh, it's not very clear, but you can see some of the stuff on this huh. taken. Now, you, you talked about conventions. I, I take it you went back to reunions and kept in touch with a lot of the well, guys? This, uh, World War II, Submarine Veterans of World War II was formed in 56, and it became a federal uh, uh, chartered. Uh, organization like Legion, and, okay, and but we're about to, it's about to dissolve because Nobody not too many left. Yeah. Not too many right. left. Uh, you take the youngest person that served in submarines in World War Two is probably eighty one years old. I'm eighty four. So. Right, right. And uh, so we have our conventions. As a matter of fact, I was the chairman for the convention, thirteenth annual convention that was held in Omaha at the Fontenelle Hotel in nineteen sixty seven. I was. Uh, I'm kind of proud of that because prior to that, when they have the convention, the hospitality room was usually in somebody's hotel room. Okay? And uh, I knew the guy that was the assistant manager at the Fontenelle Hotel. He says, John, why don't we set you up with a good uh, hospitality room? So they set us up with a rather large room, and he had a couple bars, or two or three bars in it. And uh, it was going to cost us, but, you know, we made money on it because there were enough people that she hung around there all the time because it was just a good place to meet. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in the end, we made money on it. And from that time on, the hospitality rooms at all the conventions were Is that right? after ours. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but we have a, in Nebraska, they, we had a, we have a torpedo. I'm still an associate member there. We have a uh, torpedo on a courthouse lawn at Wahoo. It's a regular torpedo mounted on a pedestal. Nebraska was the first one to put up a memorial really? of submarines, yeah. yeah. Huh. And it's got the names of all the people that sailed on the USS Wahoo that's still in the Sea of Japan. And then down here in Denver, at the southwest corner of Sloan's Lake, the southwest corner, there's a torpedo memorial to the Grayling. There were 52 boats sunk, so each state was assigned one boat with California and New York upper and lower getting a boat each, so it took care of the 52 boats. And in the end, they all put in memorials, some more elaborate than others. Ours is probably the most primitive back there in Wahoo. The one down here that we have down here in Denver is much finer. We've got a nicer base. And yeah. mm -hmm. just, but if we, if we didn't know what the hell to do back there in Nebraska. We had a torpedo, and what they did, they got together and they build a form and pour a cement pedestal and set the torpedo on it and set this base on it. That was it. It's on the courthouse lawn. We lucked out, though, we get back there because it's on the courthouse lawn and the courthouse custodian takes care of it. He puts flags around it. They even build sidewalk out to it. It's, and uh, down here in Denver, we get, we get uh, painted all the time. Yeah. Gra graffiti all the oh, time. Oh, jeez. Uh. So, so it... Did you ever uh, keep in touch with quite a few guys from the crew? Or, uh... Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, well, there's not many left. I'm still in contact. I mentioned this one fellow down in Arizona, John Beatty. Eddie Block, he was an engineer. He and I conversed quite frequently. We weren't the only two that... Well, there's a couple others. One in uh, Oregon is still alive. We just lost our executive officer, Mr. Kello, in July. Our skipper, Bill Hazard... I never thought during World War II my wife would be dancing with the skipper, but <laughs> in later years she ended up dancing. You know, it's just things you never, you don't never see. And uh, you're kind of happy that it happens that way, but at some of these uh, later conventions, the skipper was there. He died in 05 in August. A good friend, Matusik, he's the one that got me this lock, this locker. He had a, wow. uh, he had a daughter that lived there in... Uh, uh, just on the north side of uh, Washington in, in the in New Maryland there. And they had the boat sitting there before they took it down to sink it. They had it sitting there in Baltimore. So he went up and he got me that locker, that nameplate on there. 
That's from the trim pump motor. Another fella got that for me and give it to me. It's the trim pump motor that was on the Blenny. Huh. Then that piece of decking with the inscription Blenny in it, that was taken off by the town of, uh, city of uh, Ocean City. They took it off and cut up this, this teak wood deck and gave everybody to come back that piece for, I'll moment, be for done. memory. Huh. And uh, it's... That flag is. Yeah, that we'll, flag. What we'll do is we'll uh, we'll uh, at the end here we'll we'll, we'll film film yeah. that and you can tell stories about each but, of these. But that yeah. flag that was that flew over the Capitol on my 80th birthday. Is that <laughs> right? Oh, that's wonderful. I've, I'm sure it won uh, medal there. I've got the uh, the hard medal there, but I'm sure it won medal there. It's the Philippine Liberation. When I got those medals, I wrote to St. Louis for them. They were having that trouble with Renella and her husband. Oh, know, right, yeah, and, Marcus. Uh, and uh, they they said they'd send it to me. Of course, I moved up here, and it might have been after the yeah. uh, forwarding expired. I never got, mm. never did get that. Oh, okay. uh, but that combat pin, we'll, uh, that combat pin we'll, on the front of that hat. John, we'll, we'll, film, okay. we'll film all that, and you can, you can tell a lot okay. of the stories of, of each of these items. Okay. Uh, one question I always like to, uh, to ask everyone is, how did that period of your life play into your life, affect your life, change your life, uh, or, or did it? Was it just uh, just a three well, or four year I period? I think we grew up a lot. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got over that teenage baloney in a hurry. Uh, I think I was much much more mature when I come back and and went to work and and getting a lot of trouble <laughs> a person ordinarily would have yeah. those, at that stage yeah. but uh, I think that when I I think it even played into when I was manager of stations uh, well later they made it manager of transportation services I think it played into there because it uh, you learned a little bit of uh, supervisory skills when you were in the service even though you were being supervised, you still learn the skills, and uh, it helped me a lot uh, when I was working with the agents out in the field. See, they were all tele telegraphers, and I had the radio background, which is the Morse code also, so mm -hmm. I, uh, I could talk their language, and that helped a lot. Uh, I, I imagine it did help some. I didn't get. To, I didn't go to college. I kind of kicked myself for that. Money was a problem, though. Sure. Uh, you come back. You know, you can't just live on the folks. You had to pay some board and room, so you yeah. had to have some money. And then what they were paying for that uh, at that time just wasn't enough. You know, my folks had two younger kids that they had to get through. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I couldn't just freeload on them. Sure. Sure. Yeah. What? I kind of wish sometimes that I would have gone into, into a county school. That's what I did do, do a lot of in my adult life is when I was at the freight office and also when I headed up that accounting department. Also, working with the agents, I had to check all their accounting. So Something you enjoyed? I, I oh, I enjoyed he, it. He uh, probably had more from uh, his life skill or life uh, experiences than he probably would have got out of school anyway. But yeah, oh sure. Certainly. Well, I don't know about that. Hmm. I think so. Well, uh, at, we'll close down this interview, uh, the interview part of it anyhow. Uh, is there any sort of closing statement, final statement you'd like to make to, uh, to finish off the interview for people that'll, that'll see this tape someday? Or is it? <laughs> kind of put me on the spot there. Yeah, well, I mean, if they're, they're, fair enough, you know. I yeah. just, uh, uh, I, all, all I can say is if uh, any of them are ever in an area where they have some of these boats on display, now there are several places where our boats are on display. You got one in California, in, in San Francisco. There's one in Hawaii. There's one in Galveston. There's, uh, I know there's one in uh, uh, Philadelphia. There's one in uh, Baltimore. You got the one up in Manitowoc. There's one that batfish is down here in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Uh, go aboard and see. See what the quarters are like. See if they can make could uh, stand to live in something like that. Have you ever ever been in one of these modern uh, nuclear oh, submarines? Yeah, we, got, we got to go through the nuke uh, through the uh, that's, that's something Nebraska. Now you're talking about a boat that's got a forty foot circumference. Yeah, and that's a four story boat. Right. 
I mean, we were in a seagoing sewer pipe. These things are like Lord Hilton hotels, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, these guys, they have their, in the uh, the the boomer I was on, they have the bunks between the uh, missile silo and the outer curvature of the hull, so the bunks are running sideways. And every one of the guys, they have to have them three high, but every one of these bunks has their curtain in front. They have their storage underneath their mattress. It's not in the side of the boat. And they all have a uh, 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 FM hookup, you know, uh, uh, yeah. stereo, stereo yeah, hookup, is, that's what I was looking for. And they all have their own little ventilating system in their bunk. Yeah. Wow. And... Uh, uh, like I mentioned about this sound gear, everything goes to the computer and it tells you the name of the ship and everything else. You don't have to guess. When we were out at sea, these were the eyes of the boat. Yeah. They're big enough, but they were the eyes of the boat. <laughs> and uh, when I was on duty, when the other guy was on duty, it was his eyes were ears were the eyes of the boat. And uh, they got much more room on these boats. Uh, they have the mess halls are bigger. The, uh, well, I don't like their mess halls as well because their mess halls are like the buffet style. You got to where we were served right at the table. They, we had families uh, types uh, types uh, servings, and uh, automatic washers and dryers. Oh yeah, they got automatic washers and dryers. Oh, yeah, they, got automatic washers and dryers. they got everything on uh, those boats. Wow! And when you go in that missile compartment, it's so deep that they every uh, every they got. The first two silos are painted one color, and the next two are the same, the same color, but they're just a little different shade. And that's so that uh, you don't get uh, confused with your depth perception in there. Uh, you know, they keep changing the colors every, every so many uh, uh, silos. Uh, but the, foot, the, uh, the submarines today, they like those big boomers, they're five, almost two foot, football field in length. And they're 40 feet wide, where we only had 300 feet. We had one football field, you might say. Basically, put your submarine inside one oh, of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and but, then the seat that. Well, then they have regular flight seats like the pilots, and they have seat belts on for, uh, for running the bow, bow and stern planes in the helm. Well, oh, but when they fire the missiles. Well, the guy, the guy that fires the missiles, he's got a seat belt, too. Well, everybody's going to get jarred in the boat, not just him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, it just seems to, and then they get a big, huge at the story that where they make their own clean oh, water yeah. right out of the seawater. Yeah, they make enough water on these new boats to where they every man can shower after every watch. Yeah. We, we got, well, I can't, don't dare say what we used to call ours, but <laughs> <laughs> we used to get a bath twice a week, and that was with a little bit of water, uh. a minimum. I, uh, I'm sorry if I'm doing this a lot. I didn't mean to do it, and I'm catching myself doing it, but I just had some back surgery. And no, no, back no, surgery no. And <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, John, I want to uh, I want to thank you for uh, you telling your story today. It was a fascinating story. More importantly, though, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I don't know why you people do that. Uh, There's some additional stories you wanted to tell, John. Go well, ahead. Well, I forgot to tell you that uh, every submariner had to qualify on the boat within two runs or he was out of submarines. And to qualify on the boat, you had to operate everything, as I had mentioned earlier. Uh, but you had to go through the boat with the executive officer, and he would run you through all the different uh, chores that you had to do. And then, once you qualified, then you were given this dolphin's pin, the qualification badge. Uh, Well, there's one on the hat here. The other side, yeah. You got to wear these, this pin here, this pin here, that's the qualification badge. Okay. And, uh, well, you want me to just go on the hat here? Sure. This is the uh, ribbons I earned. It's the uh, American Theater, the Asi Asian Pacific Theater with one star, the Philippine Liberation with one star, the Victory Medal, Submarine combat pin. The submarine combat pin was only awarded after successful patrol runs. And I had uh, three successful patrol runs. So they got a star for each one. And this is the qualification pin. Did, did, uh, was there any, ever any sort of statistic on 
the amount of ships and and you know a total of all that you, you guys sank at all? Is there it? was, it seems to me it was over, up around 1,600 ships that were sunk during World War II. And, and it's over 5 million tons. Any idea what uh, you guys can lay claim to? Did they ever break well, that down? The Blenny, Blenny had nine capital ships, nine big ships, and 64 small ships, uh, small boat, small yeah. craft. We had a total of 73 craft. Uh, at the sinking in at uh, Ocean City, Maryland, they said that was a record for number of craft. We didn't have the record in tonnage, yeah. but we had a uh, number of craft. But there were ships like uh, the uh, Flasher, it had 26 big ships, we, like we only had nine big ships. And then the Rasher had 25, the Tang, the one that got sunk by its own torpedo on an erratic run that I had mentioned about these fellows coming up from below. Yeah. Uh, that. Uh, uh, she, they had like 24, 25. So there were some of the older boats out there that had quite a bit. Of course, the Blenny was a newer boat. It was just commissioned in, in July of, of uh, 44. And uh, so it didn't get, by the time it got out there, it only had time for three runs. And, and, and at the end of the war, the big ships were scarce. Right, sure. This is the locker door from the locker I had in the forward torpedo room on the Blenny. When they sunk it at, uh, off Ocean City, Maryland in 1989, a friend of mine asked me what locker I had. He was going to go, go down there and he got the locker for me. And then this plate here is the plate from the trim pump motor that was on the Blenny. Uh, and it shows, it's got the Blenny's name pr imprinted in there and it shows the year 1944. This is a piece of the decking that was taken off the Blenny at the time she was sunk. City of Ocean City, Maryland took the, all this decking off and cut it in pieces and inscribed the Blenny in it and gave it to all the uh, ship's members that uh, come back for the sinking. And that's the uh, the dolphin insignia again on the... Oh yeah, and then this is the dolphin. I just put that on as one of my dolphins. Show it's a submarine locker. This hat is a hat that's worn by the submarine veterans of World War II. Since we were taken in and treated so well by the Australians when they decided to adopt a uniform, they decided to use the Digger hat. That's the only official uniform the submarine veterans of World War II have. Is that right? And, uh, uh, of course, these are the, the ribbons, which I've already explained, but this is the insignia showing the world, uh, U.S. submarine veterans of World War II. And that's about the size of that. Well, that's a picture of the boot that went to boot camp there in 1943. Not much, not many lines of wear shown on that face. <laughs> this other picture is what hap shows what happens to you when you raise six kids and work two jobs part of your life. <laughs> okay, want, want to talk a little bit about this display, John? Well, this flag. It was flown over the, capital, the United States Capitol on July the 17th, 1984, wait a minute, when was it? 2004, when I was 80 years old. My daughter was living back in Fairfax, Virginia, got Ben Nighthorse Campbell, the senator from Colorado, to have it flown over the Capitol. I have a certificate here for it, too. This is a picture of the Blenny uh, when she was uh, launched at Groton, Connecticut. And this is just a nameplate the kids had made for me, but those, those are my ribbons, which I've already explained. This is the uh, American Theater, Pacific Theater, Victory Medal, Combat Pin, and the Qualification Pin, but I, missing is the Philippine Liberation Medal with one star. And of course, that's, that's the old boot at boot camp. And that's about the size of that.